I flew Steve up here because uh, Steve actually knows a lot more about kind of the technology uh, under the hood and stuff like that. So I figured he could help out with some of his uh, insight in there. Um, I'm a bit of a musician, not a freaking Liberace uh, and definitely not Pharrell. I, I could not tell you what that note is on that piece of paper, but uh, together, uh, I think we could uh, offer some cool little bits of advice that may or may not help you on your way to creating an EDM banger. We're, we're parked up on this uh, razor blade stealth here, uh, which is actually performing quite good with the uh, Universal Audio Apollo Twin. We've been playing with it all day, no major latency issues at all, really, and uh, I, what we've managed to do is uh, pull one of my tracks off uh, my usual DAW and stick it all on this laptop, and uh, we got the project in here. As you can see, I'm just gonna clicky-click Bob trick uh, there you go, look at all those channels, it's a big ugly mess. You can all click and they'll all click uh, you, once. You can, see that's why I flew Steve up here. <laughs> <laughs> you can alt click and there you go. I did not know that. I really literally just learned that. So this whole thing here is the track. It's uh, currently occupying about uh, 40 channels of uh, random stuff. And uh, the track's called Imaginary Friends. Um, we did consolidate some stuff just to save a little bit of CPU and uh, some libraries that were on other hard drives that we couldn't like port over in a hurry. So um, that's just the way it is. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna kind of do a quick run through about like you know how the track was made, how the process of creating it, and then maybe go into a little bit of um, mixing and mastering, if you will. Um, so uh, let's get started. I've seen I've seen you be in the studio and not try to make a track from start to finish, but on some days you'll just come up with melodies or chords or something like that, and then maybe at a later time you'll you'll reevaluate those and come back and and maybe like fill it out with a pick a sound for it and build it up into a track. Um, is that kind of what happened here? Did did you start with like a, a simple idea? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I, like Steve said, um, more often than not, I want to say eighty percent of my creation time, uh, as if some of you are fans and watch my streams and just see me goofing around, is uh, literally just coming up with tons of phrases and melodies and stuff like that, with no drums, no you know. I don't set out to make a track from start to finish. Uh, I. I some people do. Uh, I don't. Uh, and that's just my method. Um, and one th idea that kind of struck me for this track was actually an old track called uh, 71C. Um, and I'm just going to loop this section here. This was the melody. Mm -hmm. which was really simple, and I mean, I could have taken that in a million and one different directions, I'm sure. Uh, but as I kind of went in, uh, I start to stack uh, melodic components to it, like, uh, say, strings, uh, so can... and bass. And then all the way up to using uh, a serum as an arpeggiator on top of all that. And so as you start to stack on that phrase or that uh, 8, 16, 32 or, or whatever you want um, kind of theme, you just keep stacking, stacking, stacking. And, and the process of creating a track is essentially just, you know, bringing in and taking out those parts. So. In theory, yeah, you could write the whole track in 32 bars or however long your phrase is and, and have it, you know, at its fullest with all its drums and all the bells and whistles that where you think, you know, the track peaks out or before the drop. Um, so uh, that's kind of how I start. So, so you, you build up kind of cycling over a shorter amount of time and then once, once you sort of feel like there's something bigger, you're going to kind of duplicate that in time and then make it, make changes or, the, or start arranging bigger structure for the song. Right. Um, and as, as it is with EDM, I mean, it, it's no secret that, you know, a lot of it is, you know, sort of, you know, cycles and variations of the, like, repetition, you know. So uh, as to follow the formula that, you know, you're going to have, you know, peaks and drops, peaks and drops, but have that consistency across the whole, like, on average, I guess, uh, six to 
10 minute long track um you know you're gonna have your your intro kind of thing and then you know maybe around this neighborhood uh after uh, 64 bars you know your drums kind of kick in and then you have that main i don't know the main dance part i think is the correct musical term for it um and then uh you know a little breakdown and then back and then outro uh it's pretty formulaic in that department um but uh, and then, yeah, it's just, it's like painting, you know, you have different colors, different types of paint. And it's a lot you can do within that framework to kind of make, make your own sound or, or make your own original song, not sound like every other song as well. Um, so cool. So you have, you have basically two kind of main sections of the song. There's the parts that you just played with the melody and the chords. And then there's uh, the main drop section, which is more kind of drums and, and, and a bass part. And a hint of the root of the main melody. Um, Carries through. Yeah, it just carries through constantly, um, which is, I think, here. There you go. I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but there's really a lot going on in here um, in terms of all the percussion and uh, little lifters and bells and whistles and stuff that just kind of keeps it interesting to some degree. Right, so building this up, is this something you typically would start with like the kick drum? I mean, I know a lot of people kind of tend, if you're working on like a drop section, you kind of build your drums up and then... Yeah, 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 yeah. Usually it's just, you know, kind of like, as I would do with melodies, is also I create drum patterns or, or drum buses and routines uh, that just, you know, will work with anything that you put in it. Um, so it's like a Mr. Potato Head music to me, you know? <laughs> And you can take that how you like, but that's what it is. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head EDM. Cool, so you, you search through like folders of samples on your hard disk and you find like a kick or, and find some sounds that seem to complement that. Yeah, and um, if, of course, you know, you don't have to go and find this and find that. I mean, there's just so many options to go in and, you know, use your own synths, create your own samples. Right, so sometimes you'll add some loops in with these drums to just sort of like flesh it all out, right? It's just right. Like, as a background kind of thing. And then I think there's some percussion you have in here too, right? That comes in as sort of like a lift to like. Uh, yeah, yeah. Up. There's a. Uh, I, what what did I call it? Hype this is my naming convention, oh. by the way. Hats and shit. I don't know. Actual shake, uh, ride. So you've got a bunch of different instances playing different sounds on different beats, kind of. Is that what's happening? Uh, yeah. So I, I have here like a, a bass crap uh, bus, if you will. In Ableton, it's cool because you group, and then the top of the group is your bus channel. Um, or alternatively, you can add another audio track and then write anything to it. I used to do that too, but then I just found this to be way simpler. So what I do here is I have all these instances of Serum basically playing, you know, the, the corresponding note that I want for that kind of low-end drone. Now, it sounds a little weird. Um, of course, if I bypass the limiter in LFO tool, which I'll explain real quick. So as you say, the limiter is not really doing much. It's just kind of taming everything and keeping it at all like at the same uh, level. Um, and then once that's, as you can see here, it's just kind of you know ducking everything down like 7 dB or, or yeah. lifting it up. It's squashing it pretty hard. It's kind of yeah, it's aggressive. Um, and then what I'm running after that is the LFO tool. Um, because what that is doing here is it's ducking along with the kick, as I'm sure you guys all are aware of how, you know, sidechain compression works. Uh, the reason I do use uh, LFO tool is just through the consistency of, you know, the, using a sample accurate uh, envelope level to get a very consistent sound every time. So um, even if I rendered out, you know, like, uh, say, two bars or half a bar or a quarter of a bar of that, it's going to sound the same every time. Right. So just in case someone doesn't understand, you're using the LFO tool to basically take these bass sounds down in volume when the kick drum is happening. Right. And then that way, if the kick and the bass drum aren't, aren't sort of conflicting down on the low end. Right. And then so as the kick drum goes away, the bass comes back. And so they kind of get that, that nice back and forth. So without the LFO tool, you're going to get a little... Yeah, it just feels too busy. And, and that lets it pump. It makes the kick feel bigger, too. Because at that time, you're reducing the volume of everything but the kick. Um, and then when you get to the master by that time, you know, a lot of kick is going through. So things like the UAD Shadow Hills compressor will, you know, squash it out a bit. Steve's OTT, 
just got a little, not too much, but a, a little bit of depth to, uh, you know, bringing out the highs and some, actually not really doing much with the lows. 